Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Hey, uh, I'm, I'm Jack Haley, the Vice President of Meetings and Membership at AUSA. And before I bring up uh, Major General Retired Rodney Anderson to introduce our next panel, I just want to make one uh, announcement that uh, we should have made this morning. Uh, for the first time, uh, AUSA is offering a no-cost basic membership to to anyone. It's not it's not associated with any grade or civilian, military. Anyone who applies, it's a no-cost basic membership uh, to AUSA. So, if you're not a member, there's absolutely really no reason not to be a member. It won't cost you a dime, and you get all the great benefits of these forums and all of the great products and resources that AUSA provides. So uh, I just wanted to make that announcement because it is new, and we're trying it out here uh, at Fort Bragg at the Warfighter for the first time. No cost, basic membership. So thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, you sound a little weak. Good morning. Good morning, sir. All the way. All the way. You're supposed to say airborne. All the way. Airborne. 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 All the way. Airborne. airborne. Welcome and thank you very much for being here uh, today for this very uh, uh, important uh, event uh, to fellow general officers, commanders, NCOs, soldiers, veterans, uh, community partners. Um, and most especially to our military spouses. Each time I think of a military spouse, I... Yes, I feel that way about it. Um, uh, each time I think of a military spouse, I'm reminded of myself uh, some uh, many years ago as a bachelor captain in command of Alpha Battery 1st 319th Airborne Field Artillery Regiment. And a group of three spouses from the battery came to my office and they said, Captain Anderson, you take care of our husbands and we'll take care of you. And they absolutely did that. And I count what they did in taking care of their service members and in taking care of our unit is one of the most important elements of our army. It really is the secret weapon of our Army. The secret weapon is we have just thousands of military spouses who, who volunteer their time and talents without pay to support our Army and our Army mission. So please give our military spouses a big round of applause. I am Major General Retired Rodney Anderson. I am the chair of the North Carolina Military Affairs Commission. I am a lifetime member of the Association of the United States Army, Braxton Bragg Chapter, and I am a soldier for life. Welcome to Community Grit, Building Family Support. As your professional association, the Association of the United States Army is proud to provide panels like this one throughout the year to broaden the knowledge of Army professionals and those interested in and in support of our Army. AUSA amplifies the U.S. Army's narrative to further the Association's mission, which is very important, to be the voice of the Army and support for soldiers. We cannot do this alone. AUSA relies on its members to help tell the Army's story to support soldiers and their families. A strong mem membership base is vitally important in advancing the Army's mission. AUSA is engaged with Congress, the Pentagon, the Defense Industrial Base, and communities across the nation. Some 121 AUSA chapters, 108 within the United States, and 13 other countries. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, there's a chapter right here, the Braxton Bragg chapter of AUSA. And so if you're a member and you're not already affiliated with the Braxton Bragg chapter, please do. And if you're not a member, you heard the good news. It is a free, no-cost membership. So if you're not already a member, please go to Booth 300 and sign up 
to become a member of the Association of the United States Army. Um, what I'd like to do now is uh, just, just say thank you to all of you and uh, to General Brown, sir, thank you for really as a president for all that you do in supporting uh, our Army and, and, and our association. And so at this point, I would like to uh, turn the microphone over to uh, the panel chair, Ms. Holly Daly, the Director of Family Readiness, who will tell us about this amazing panel. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, and thank you for your continuous dedication to our soldiers and their families. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning and happy Wednesday. Welcome to the 2022 AUSA Warfighter Summit and Exposition. As you heard, my name is Holly Daly, and I'm your AUSA Family Readiness Director. So how does family readiness fit into the warfighter theme, America's response force, ready today, ready tomorrow. Well, our warfighters are more effective and can focus on the mission if he or she knows that everything at home is fine. No matter where our families are located, building an immediate support system is imperative to thrive. Building strong relationships is the key. And in absence of in-person connectiveness, we have learned through the pandemic that technology has introduced many ways of making and sustaining connections to others, to resources, and to timely information. As long as those connections are made, our families are not alone. This is a continuous cycle as we continue to educate and learn from each other because new families join the Army journey every year. Our panel is here to talk to us today about building family readiness support systems and equipping our families with the necessary tools to build grit and to be ready and resilient. I am honored to introduce the moder moderator for today's forum, Mrs. Tina Wright. Tina is our newest member of the AUSA Senior Fam Fellow Program. She was raised in a military family, and as an Army spouse of 33 years, she has served in various levels of leadership roles. Throughout her years, she was also deeply devoted to education and athletic programs as a teacher's assistant. Tina continues her dedication to supporting our service members and their families through her servant leadership. Thank you, Tina, for moderating today's panel, and over to you. I'm happy to be AUSA's newest senior fellow and the moderator for today's panel. Joining us today are the Chief of Staff, United States Army Material Command, Major General Walter M. Dunsey, Deputy Garrison Commander Fort Bragg, Dr. Kevin Grease, AUSA's 2021 Volunteer Family of the Year, Tawny Dixon, Development of Community Relations Director, Armed Service YMCA, Fort Bragg, Jill Salvia, Chairman of Military Arms Council, Greater Fayetteville Chamber of Commerce, Stephen Moore. At this time, our panelists will provide us with some opening remarks. Major General Walter Dusby. So, hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, I, I can't tell you what a privilege it is to, uh, to be here this morning uh, to, to sit on this panel. And when General Daly told me I was going to get an opportunity to do this, I was really excited because uh, part of my portfolio uh, in the in, in Army Material Command is the quality of life initiatives that AMC uh, moves out on uh, that are set by the senior Army leadership. Uh, and so, getting a chance to bring some of that here to this forum and, and share it because I will tell you many of these things I was not aware of a year ago when I was uh, originally assigned to AMC so it's been a, and I've been around the Army a long time like many in this room have but it's been a learning experience for me 
Uh, but uh, as, as Holly Daly said earlier, you know, th there's no doubt that uh, quality of life and uh, the readiness of our families are directly tied with the Army's ability to execute its prime mission, which is to fight and win our nation's wars. And uh, I don't think that's a, a strange comment to anybody in uniform in here or anybody who's wore a uniform at any time. Uh, that, that's nothing new. But the amount of emphasis that we're placing on it and the prioritization that it currently has and is going to have into the future uh, is, is incredible. And I'm going to share some of that with you here today uh, uh, about uh, some of our, uh, uh, the priority areas in the initiatives that we have going on and some of the details, which you may not be aware of, that I think will help reinforce exactly where uh, the Army is currently and where the Army is going around quality of life. Army Material Command, we got about 175,000 people. And that old story that for every soldier we have in a motor puller out there on the front lines, there's like 20 folks behind them that keep them there. That's actually true. In fact, it's more like 50 or 100 <clears throat> folks that do that. And the command has full responsibility for the logistics, sustainment, uh, and materiel readiness for the Army. But we also have responsibility for all the installation readiness, which ties right back in to those quality of life initiatives through our, uh, through MCOM uh, down there in San Antonio. And I know we have Dr. Grease here uh, as a rep. So I'm gonna talk a little bit macro. He's gonna get, uh, talk a little bit micro and a little bit more operational tactical around these initiatives. Uh, but at the end of the day, know that all the leadership of the Army, in fact, I, I, I'll give you an example. Last week, uh, General Flynn was visiting the headquarters, sit there. We have two of the Army four-star generals sitting down talking uh, about Army Materiel Command, PACOM, the Pacific, and uh, a good majority of that discussion was around quality of life initiatives that were directly tied to the war fighting function. How are we going to raise the quality of life standards so that we can keep soldiers out there doing what they need to do? We owe them the peace of mind to know that their families are being taken care of that the highest standards are being maintained so they could fully focus on their mission. And that was just as of last week uh, with two of our Army senior leaders and uh, getting a chance to, to, to sit at that table and, and hear that discussion. So there's an absolute commitment around this and we want to deliver that at every installation to every family across the Army. So uh, the first area that I want to focus on here, and, and I've got some notes because there's a lot of detail here that I don't think many are familiar with, and it's important for the context at the macro level about what we're doing, is PCS moves. And uh, everyone in here has experienced them. There's no such thing as an easy move. And, uh, and the Dusney family is no exception to that. And so we've experienced it. I've experienced it myself as a soldier. Uh, m many of us have. Sometimes they go a little bit smoother than others, right? Uh, but it's a stressful time for Army families, and, and you know, the goal is to provide timely quality service and a smooth, effective, efficient PCS move because we know that the Army is in, in, in constant motion. But some things that, that, that we've done, because there's been a number of, uh, last two, three years, we've had a couple of really rough surge seasons. And, and this year, I don't want to jinx it, but things seem to be going smoother. A lot of the things that we've implemented are making a difference this year so far. At least that's the, uh, what the data is showing. But ultimately, uh, a lot of the initiatives that have been uh, uh, put in place over the last two or three years appear to be having positive results, and I'm going to highlight a couple of those here. Uh, we've implemented standards-based quality assurance inspections, inspecting 100% of shipments prior to movement. The amount of shipments that were act actually inspected uh, prior to this was low at best. In fact, it was surprisingly low, and some of the statistics are not even worth repeating. They were so low uh, back in the day. It's now 100%. The claims process has been streamlined and simplified to speed up reimbursements and getting that money back into soldiers and their families' hands after damaged goods. And anybody that ever went through that uh, back in the day and watch something fall out of the truck and break out there in the street and then know that it's going to be a six or eight month journey to get any reimbursement for any of that uh, knows exactly what I'm talking about. So that has been streamlined. The feedback we're getting is that is working much better. We're reimbursing 100% of the cost of a government move when a soldier chooses to move their own household goods and reimbursing fuel uh, surcharges rates for bulky items that are moved. 
So that's a big change, 100% reimbursement of cost if the soldier says, hey, I'll just move my own stuff if you guys are willing to pay for it. Big change. Uh, another uh, a change that we're getting a lot of uh, good feedback about is uh, the vouchers and smart voucher program uh, for PCS travel vouchers uh, reduces the amount of errors and the amount of time for soldiers uh, to process that voucher. Has anybody in here used the smart voucher yet on a PCS move? If you, if you have, raise your hand, okay? So we have a few folks in here who have, ha who have used that system. That's out there, it's available 24-7. Uh, that has brought down the reimbursement time by about 50% and also drastically reduced the amount of errors and that sort of back and forth in the voucher that just delay uh, the completion and actually getting that reimbursement. <clears throat> so, I mean, ultimately we know that, you know, hey, COVID, com we, COVID environment, very tough uh, on, the, on, the, on the PCS environment, uh, labor shortages, supply chain challenges that we're having, uh, these current conditions make PCSing tougher than it ever has been. But the Army leadership has realized that, and we put a number of measures in place, some of which that I've highlighted, to try to make that move go as smoothly as it possibly can. The last thing I'd like to highlight about this is the My Army PCS app, which is active out there in Apple Store and Google. You could download it. I have it on my phone right now. Uh, that is active. It has all the resources, step-by-step -step guides for PCS, you know, right there uh, on your smartphone. Uh, definitely something worth taking a look at and sharing uh, with your soldiers. And uh, one other thing I'd like to just highlight is, is um, for all the officers and NCOs and members of the chain of command, uh, there's a huge responsibility in helping soldiers make their PCS moves smooth. Uh, old soldiers have done it. They've been through it many times. Younger soldiers, not so much. Uh, and, you know, the chain of command has to be fully engaged in this process. Know that, hey, you got that app on, the, on your phone, soldier, because I got it on mine. If you haven't, take a look at that tonight and let's have a conversation about your PCS move. Uh, it's no, it, no secret, many of these things, chain of, cam, chain of command involvement, the officers and NCOs in the chain of command are keys uh, to, to successfully uh, improving this space for our soldiers and their families. The next priority I'd like to hit on here, and one that uh, also uh, a lot of conversation around the senior army leadership around housing. And uh, the, the, the obvious goal of the army is to provide, you know, two standard, safe, healthy housing and maintain the trust of our soldiers and their army families who are staying in army housing. I mean, that's, that's the end state. Like all things uh, that we do in the army, we're, we, we are uh, working very hard to achieve that. Uh, just to give you an idea of scope and scale, something I did not know uh, before my assignment at AMC, I'm gonna talk some numbers here about the housing portfolio that the army has and what MCOM uh, is working with on a day-to-day -day basis. We have almost 10,000 Army-owned homes. These are homes that the Army still maintains uh, ownership of. We have over 2,000 barracks in the Army. We have 87,000 homes under our privatized home, under privatized companies, uh, residential community initiative, RCI companies that manage these homes for the Army, 87,000 homes. Just to give you an idea, across 44 installations, huge. The amount of investment that the Army and these privatized companies is making over time is staggering. It's billions of dollars, and I'm gonna share some of the data with you here today. On post housing plans right now call for 2,700 new homes and 15,000 renovated homes by FY25. Think about that. We're going to renovate 15,000 homes. At least 26% of the total housing inventory will be completely renovated by FY30. And we're committed to single soldiers and barracks improvement in our facilities investment plan. $4.9 billion between FY21 and FY26. So a massive investment 
in housing uh, by the Army to continue to, uh, to improve uh, and to bring the standard of our barracks uh, up and the standard of Army housing. Working very hard to uh, increase, a lot of this is based on communication, right? We got to be communicating with families. We know that communication is the key. When folks are not being communicated with, they don't know what's going on, uh, there can be a, uh, then you're, you're thinking the worst, right? So we brought the digital garrison and army maintenance apps online, and I know uh, Dr. Grease, Kevin's going to talk about those here shortly and the success that we've had with those uh, on our installations and in, uh, in ability for soldiers and their families to access information. You go on the maintenance app and you could put a, a, a maintenance call in on the app and then track it through its completion, not only for a, a, a home or a residence, but also in the barracks as well. Also conducting the standard town halls and, uh, and hotlines on the installations, listening to the feedback. Uh, we did uh, implemented a tenant bill of rights. Uh, it's hard to believe we had housing didn't have a tenant bill of rights. I mean, you can't go anywhere without it, it exists now. And it's pretty comprehensive and uh, covers all the rights that those who stay uh, in Army housing have. Uh, and that was implemented last year. Uh, a lot of hard work went into bringing that online. Uh, but we are holding uh, these privatized companies accountable and holding ourselves accountable. But again, uh, similar to PCS moves, chain of command uh, involvement around act barracks standards, activities in the barracks, army housing, critical, critical to the success if we're going to achieve the success that we want to over time uh, in the housing area. I'd also like to take a little bit of time this morning talking about childcare. Uh, the Army has a goal of providing, you know, the highest quality, availability, affordability, and the highest standard of child care and youth services uh, to our families. And, uh, and this has come a long ways in my Army career. I mean, there was a time when you'd drive around a fort, you name a fort, and you would not see youth centers or child development centers on, on many, if any, Army installations. Uh, today, they're all over the place, and there's going to be a lot more. We got 21 projects planned through FY30 to increase the number of those facilities and the number of that type of capability that we'll have for our families and our soldiers uh, in the future. 100% of Army child and youth programs are certified by the Department of Defense, and, and, and that's a really big deal. And 95% or 97% of our Army child development centers. So uh, they're nationally accredited. That, that's the highest standard that you could achieve. And you'd be surprised that outside the gate, many are not. I was surprised to see the statistics around uh, the amount of centers that are out there on the economy that do not achieve that standard. But uh, that, the bar is set very high, and uh, it, is, uh, it is something uh, that we will continue, that, that standard will continue in the future as we bring more of these centers and more of this capability online. In terms of spouse employment, another one of the Army senior leader priorities around quality of life, the goal is to increase the opportunities for spouses to uh, gain employment as, as they're uh, part of a military family, particularly challenging when you PCS around. I've faced that in my own life. Tracy has a career, and uh, we've had mixed degrees of success depending on where I was and where we were in terms of uh, finding uh, good, good employment quickly, and, and uh, so, and many in the audience here, I'm sure, have experienced that as well. Uh, senior leadership and the Army leadership well aware of this. We know it's important. We know it's an important aspect of quality of life. We know what dual income can mean uh, to, to any family, and Army families in particular. And so we're going to continue to build uh, the types of partnerships out there uh, with the communities that allow our spouses to gain access and information, and a lot of it is exactly that. Uh, we're also working with uh, the, uh, the civilian employment assignment tool, the SEAT tool. Many of you may be familiar with that. We've expanded uh, its utilization, and now 22,000 employees who are working in the MWR uh, Family Morale, Welfare, and Recreation Program, many of them are Army spouses, have much easier ability to transfer their uh, job to a new location and gain a position there using this tool as their spouse uh, PCSs. We're also streamlining the home-based business 
uh, initiative and application approval process. We talked, that, that was based on feedback we got from spouses who were interested in home-based businesses and talking about, I had a question, hey General, do you know how complicated it is to actually start a home-based business? And, I, and at that time, I actually didn't. And it was, it was extremely complicated to a point where I think Tracy would have just said, hey, look, forget this. I mean, we're just, we're not gonna get there, you know, in the next two years, that's for sure. Uh, that has been completely reworked, the whole application process and the approval process, much streamlined uh, so that you can get that home-based business up and running and actually, uh, you know, uh, making money at it uh, and, uh, and providing that additional income and uh, career. So this just highlights, you know, th those are four, uh, there, there's a lot more there, but I think I'll stop there for, for this morning. I know we're gonna have some question and answers, but I, I just wanted to give some, you know, kind of at a macro level, uh, what we're doing, but I, I can't, I'll close with this. Senior Army leadership fully engaged on this. Can't be anywhere in any discussion of any, any critical nature where quality of life, how's it gonna affect families, what are we doing about housing, barracks, doesn't come up. The investment over time is massive, but it, it is gonna take some time, and it's gonna take a lot of focus, time, money, effort, resources, uh, that is being applied, uh, but it's leadership at Echelon, engagement on all of these subjects that are going to be uh, the key to success for our soldiers and their families. And so I'll stop there. Thank you. So, <clears throat> first of all, thanks to the AUSA for allowing this forum so we can discuss this because it's very exciting. I'm very enthusiastic to be up here today. General Desney introduced several of the core anchors of Quality of Life Initiatives. And it's just really important. I, I would, I've been doing this business here, Fort Bragg, not at Fort Bragg, but a, as a deputy garrison commander for about 12 to 15 years. And the, the change you see in Army senior leadership currently is that it's, it's a recognition, not only a recognition that quality of life enhances readiness, but it's a cornerstone of readiness. In other words, it, it facilitates readiness. It's just not something we should do to make sure that things don't go off the rails. And they're investing money and time, conversations, discussions, um, senior leader effort into that. It's refreshing, and I'm at the point of delivery for that, and I, I just, I'm going to be very excited to share with you. I'm going to share with you the framework of how. We've talked about what we're doing, but how do we do it? How do we get down to the ground? One of the things that AMC, uh, the Army, Army senior leaders through AMC, down through MCOM, at the point of delivery, which is the garrisons, talks about is the delivery of services, services, programs, and infrastructure or facilities on how we do this. One of the most interesting parts of that is, what does quality of life mean to anybody? Every single person you poll would have a different standard, different criteria. It's impossible to have unlimited resources, though, so it's important that senior leaders create priorities, and they have done that. So because quality of life has risen to be a cornerstone of readiness, we have connected more with a triad. The triad of quality of life is the chain of command, the senior senior commander, senior army leaders, down to the platoon leader, down to the squad leader. That stays in sponsorship and other things you've already talked about. The person themselves, the soldiers and family members themselves is part of it. And then partnered directly with that, a facilitator, an integrator of that is the garrison. It is MCOM, AMC, the garrison. And that's what I'd like to outline. The first thing is to understand that the garrisons are an entity, a command unto themselves. But what's really important is we speak what this, this panel's title is, is that every garrison, every installation is first and foremost a community, a community of, full, of structure, of, of cross-support. But it's also a community, it's one of the only communities ever uh, compared to outside that goes to war and comes back from war. So that is a, a prime, the, cri the stresses on our families and our soldiers are not necessarily comparable. Stress is comparable, but the reasons for it are different in our, we have to acknowledge that. The, so the Army management, uh, excuse me, AMC tell, talks, works with the garrisons in MCOM. We work with the senior commander. The senior commander and the garrison commander are the leadership framework at the garrison level, at the point of delivery, to ensure this gets done. We're very proud of doing that as well. We work with the, the individual commands, but we really work to establish a community. And here at Bragg, we try to put that into some pillars of effort. 
the three pillars of effort we have is ready, resilient, and relevant. The ready means are we helping our families and soldiers be ready for everyday events in the PCS? If you've PCS 10 times, a PCS stress level is different than it's the very first one you've ever had to do in your entire life. So do I even get a car? Where do I get my pets taken care of? If you're going overseas or you're coming here, all those things can be significant. People have, we have soldiers that have never, leaving AIT and coming, with us, coming to us, that have never even left the state they've been in when they grew up. So it's important that we understand that. So the first one is to be ready, ready for regular life. The second one is resilient. When you're faced with something that happens, a deployment, a PCS, good housing, bad housing, a lack of employment, or you get employment, all those types of things is they cause stress. We provide training, we want people to be resilient. We want families and soldiers to be resilient in meeting those challenges. We can think about deployments as being a, we can put that in a context, but the individual challenge is daily event. A spouse who, there's only one car in the family and the service member has to take that car to go to work and the spouse is not at home and the spouse does not have any transportation at home, I got two kids, right? You feel isolated, right? I, I can't even go get milk, I can't do the things, I can't, and then when my spouse comes home, if the person's not deployed, I have this long list of things I want to get done if I'm a spouse, and it just adds to So quality of life for us is community building, but quality of life as we define it here at Bragg, under those three pillars, is the reduction of friction and anxiety in a, in a person's life, period. With every customer interaction, uh, providing housing, replenishing housing, all those types of things. That is our goal. Our goal is to reduce friction and anxiety in the lives of our soldiers and family members. It is a prime directive for us here at the Garrison. The Army has invested time, money, and effort, and staff, and other things to do that. I have the pride and the honor of being able to deliver that at the ground level, and I'm very proud of that. So we do that in three different ways. Again, I was, I'm talking about the construct for this. Three different ways is, first of all, we work hard to uh, expand our portfolio of services and the quality of those services that we are providing. But we're limited. So what we do is, once we reach our max capacity or we find a unique situation for a family, we're trying to get to yes, we'll partner with the local city. The local city government in the local government, for example, there's an example right now where they're lobbying the state to uh, accept cross-state certifications for work so that home-based businesses can, be, can take off and that spouses, when they get PCS'd, they can come to another state and their certification and whatever it may be is honored. That's a partnership we're doing. We partner with other agencies, whether it's Army uh, AFES, it's Commissary, it's USO, it's Red Cross, it's YMCA, it's other agencies. We partner with them because they can bring, they expand our portfolio because they can bring things that we can't bring. But the bottom line is we partner with them and we connect them back with the soldiers and the families through the unit changes of command, uh, not changes of command, hopefully I'm not getting rid of anybody, but the uh, chains of command, excuse me. That is our, our mission. So the first thing we do is we provide the services. The second thing that's most important is access to those services because we don't want to have a service that's the world-class service like child care. Child care, like the general said, child care in the United States Army, I'll throw, I'll throw my next paycheck on it, is the best child care in the United States, bar none, have a nice day. Some of our families don't know that. Do they know that we have a 1,700 item checklist that gets, gets annually certified every single year? That we have external evaluators that come in and check every single thing? They, they don't always know that. So how do I connect them with that so they can have greater confidence in their services and know how to use it? That's a challenge. We do that through the chains of command and we also do that through the apps and things. We've gone, we've adopted best practices from private city, uh, private public cities to do smart city initiatives, to do apps, like the Digital Garrison app, which is like a portal app. And then you have PCS, and you have housing, and you have a maintenance app, Army maintenance app called ARMA. Those apps are individual apps, but they're not separate. They're individual because today's generation, and you know, some of the older ones, like to have customized stuff. I only want to know about housing, I only want to do a work order, I don't need the whole thing. But the Digital Garrison app is the prime and gives you access to all those. That is a cornerstone, especially if you're coming and doing something for the very first time, which is a, a PCS or, or just movement or a first deployment. So we do that. That's the second part is we get access, we connect. 
we market it, we have offices, we have people that go out, we do town halls, we get uh, all types of things. But then the third thing we do, which is, I think, I argue is the most important item, is that when we get feedback, we actively search for feedback. And when we get feedback, we react to it the best we can within our resources, as fast as we can, so that there's a loop. We do that, again, like I said, through town halls, through surveys. We do an annual survey in the housing area. That is, we, we, it's maybe a burden to some people, but we look at that line by line by line by line, and we're able to track it across years. Are the efforts that we're doing, are the investments we're doing making a difference in how people are feeling? That is a key component. That's the three components of this for us. Again, I wanted to outline that today. I'm not going to talk too much longer. I can go in any question. Um, I get excited about this, so I apologize because I believe in this and we can always, I can go forever. But that's our cornerstone. We have these pillars, ready, resilient, and relevancy. And relevancy, I didn't discuss relevancy, but relevancy means that the service we provide are modern, are up to date, like childcare, the best. Our houses, when we're renovating the houses, we're not just patch painting the, re the houses, we're bringing them up where these are modern houses and you can take a picture of the renovated houses here at Bragg, for example, put them on Zillow, I think, and you would not know the difference. This is a two or $300,000 house that the Army is providing them through the RCI. All those are exciting components. And then we do the three components of we provide the best services, we connect to partners when we can, we get access, we highlight access, and then we have rapid response to customer feedback. Are we perfect? No, we're not perfect, right? But we're a whole lot better than we used to be, and we're trying every single day to get better, stronger, and faster every single day. And part of that is coming here and, and talking. So that again, once again, I just want to say thank you to the panel members that have joined me up here, but also the AUSA for this fantastic opportunity. Thank you. Hey, hey Doc, what, what, before we move on, real quick, he, he, uh, Kevin mentioned something. Uh, I, I would ask, the tenant satisfaction survey, uh, if you stay in, in Army housing, you're going to receive a, a tenant satisfaction survey. Please, please fill it out and encourage your soldiers. Chain of command, engage. When that survey comes out, it carries weight. In many cases, it didn't tell us. Uh, this, this past year, we got a better response rate than, than the previous year, so that, that was good. In many cases, it validates what we already know, but the power that that survey has up on the hill and with leaders is unbelievable. We could say it all day long, but in the survey, when, when it gets, it's like reinforcing fires and uh, very powerful. Uh, so uh, th that thing was looked at from every angle this year, all, all the way to the top Army leadership uh, and secretary level. So I, I can't, you know, just encourage everybody to take the opportunity to take that survey. We want to know what our soldiers and their families think about the house that they're living in. Thanks. And I would like to add one thing is, when I talk about communities, I'm not talking about just from Bragg. I've been at, I've been at several other garrisons as well. The thing that gets missed, and this is the value of AMC and MCOM, the value they bring to the table, is that the Army is not just a network of garrisons, it's a network of communities across the entire Army. And the Army, uh, excuse me, AMC and MCOM are, are the connectors of those communities for resources and everything. So we're not one thing. So when you leave Garrison Bragg or you come into Garrison Bragg, you go and land at a garrison that has the same types of services and the same emphasis on quality of life. That's the importance of this is there's not, a, there's, the Army has done a really good job of trying to have no, not have any have or have nots um, over time. So we've standardized uh, along the quality of life efforts. So that's an important, we get those questions all the time is, I'm at Bragg and I get this, but do I get this when I go someplace else? And the answer is yes, you do. And yes, you will. And you'll get the same commitment. So thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, AUSA, thank you so much for letting me be a part of this panel today. I'm very excited to be here as a military spouse, uh, representing volunteerism and in my professional life, um, overseeing family and readiness programs. Um, I just can't stress the importance of building your community and what you're putting in your toolbox to make you ready and resilient as a family member. I'll give some real world examples for you. So when I was a brand new military spouse, um, my husband deployed and I got really, really sick and I ended up living in a military hospital for six months. And I didn't know how to ask for help because I'm a very independent individual. And so I had to learn very quickly 
to build my community and what I needed to put in my toolbox so that I could move forward with my husband and his military career. And so some of those things were uh, just knowing who I could ask to help watch my dogs, what facilities I could put my dogs in for boarding if those neighbors weren't available for me. Also knowing special power of attorneys, military one source, if I needed to go back home to my family, how I could make sure that I was still covered under TRICARE. Um, also, more recently, my husband is currently deployed and my new vehicle decided to stop working. <laughs> um, so it was in the shop for about five weeks. Um, mechanical or wiring issue, couldn't figure out what was wrong with it. So I had to buy a brand new car. And I've learned, even though I know all about special power of attorneys and I've utilized them multiple times, that certain banks require very specific special power of attorneys that you can't necessarily get from your JAG office. So I had to learn about that. Um, and just the power of volunteerism in general. So that's how I've built my sense of community, is getting involved in volunteerism. Um, I like to help others and I feel like the more you the more you make yourself the community, everyone else will feel a part of the community. My parents moved 37 times in my life. I went to multiple different schools, so I was always the new kid. So being a part of the military family is not something that's new to me as far as developing new relationships, but it is it was new to me as far as the deployment side of it. Um, and also for my professional life, just watching, so I work for the 2nd Airborne Division and I get to see 20,000 paratroopers and all of their families and what we go through here at, at Fort Bragg. I had gone through multiple deployments before, but when my husband got activated for that very first immediate response force on New Year's Eve, that was a different deployment I had never experienced in my life. Um, you know, usually you have that fenced-in period, you know that's going to be a nine-month deployment, you tentatively have a redeployment date, but for an IRF mission, you don't know. You have literally no idea. It's whatever the mission requirement is. Um, and then we went into a global pandemic, which was new for the whole world. <laughs> and then we had to utilize a lot of resources that most of us were unfamiliar with. You know, we had spouses that had to quit their job and they had to learn how to virtually teach their children. We had families that lost their job just due to, you know, no longer being able to afford them because of COVID. And then we had families who had to utilize pan food pantries that they didn't even know where they could get them. And so, being able to utilize and know your resources that are on your installation and around your community. Here at Fort Bragg, we are the center of the universe. However, we are a very huge installation. And so we have families that live 45 to an hour and a half away from the installation. We have families that live right on the installation. I personally live 35 minutes away from the installation. So if I wasn't a part of the Fort Bragg community on Garrison and also outside of the community, I don't know what I would have done. So I cannot stress the importance of getting involved in your community on and off post and also knowing your resources. And one of the biggest resources that I can say is Military One Source because it doesn't matter if you're at home on Fort Bragg or if you go somewhere and you need to contact them. They have a unit service coordinator that can help you find your resources no matter where you are uh, in the world. And one of those things that came up was when there was a hurricane in Louisiana. As an SFRG leader, we had a family member who was down in, at home in Louisiana, and the service members were deployed. And so we reached out to Military One Source, and they were able to help them uh, provide resources and help them find a, a safe place to stay. So just making sure that you're utilizing your resources, you're understanding your resources, and that will help you be ready and resilient. Thank you so much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jill Kai. I'm from the Armed Services YMCA. Um, we're kind of, uh, we get confused a lot with a normal YMCA, so we don't have a pool or a gym. I wish we had a pool right now, to be honest with you. But uh, we have 12 different, uh, we have 12 branches across the entire military footprint, 18 total with some of our subsidiaries. Um, Armed Services YMCA focuses primarily on the everyday life of our 
soldiers, our, for us soldiers, but for our service members and their families. What can we do every day to make their lives easier? Um, what can we do here at Fort Bragg? What our main purpose here is not only strengthening our families, but how to make our families ready at a moment's notice. So um, that's what we do at the Armed Services YMCA. Our, main, our mission actually is strengthening military families. And I go back to a quote that I use very often um, from the 38th Chief of Staff of the Army, General Odierno. The strength of our nation is our army. The strength of our army is our soldier. The strength of our soldier is our family. And that's what makes us army strong. So I always go back to what are we doing to strengthen that family component? It's like kind of open-ended. So at the Armed Services YMCA, that's what we focus on, strengthening that military family, strengthening our Fort Bragg families in particular. So what can we do to make their everyday life easier? We do focus on junior military, excuse me, junior enlisted military service members and their families with most of our programming at no cost to them. But what's so encouraging being here today is I see a lot of senior leaders. We want to make sure that you know we exist. We're on one of the small mule barns right beside, we always say, find the Braggin Barn, you'll find Armed Services YMCA. We're kind of tucked in behind there. But we want you as leaders to know we exist so you can provide those resources to your junior enlisted. We have everything from a food pantry, the only one that exists authorized to exist on Fort Bragg, um, that is something to help supplement monthly. Um, and one thing I'm encouraged about to say about our food pantry, we don't have people coming to our food pantry for a year. It's one or two months just to supplement a small, a small part of their life. Um, and we do that for all service members. It's not a junior enlisted program. It's open to all ranks. It's also open to all area veterans. We also offer childcare programming. Um, we mentioned childcare here today. One of the programs I'm most proud of to say that we have, we have children's waiting room. Right now, we exist in the Cohen Family Military Clinic here in Fayetteville, for, in Fayetteville that services all military, including veterans. Um, you can go there free of charge. It's a drop-off child care program. Um, it's something we work directly with the White House with our, our National Armed Services YMCA to provide that service, making sure that our service members, our family members, and our veterans are receiving mental health care, and child care is not the reason they're not receiving it. Um, so I'm very proud of that as well. And we work directly with CYS as well to hopefully at one time, at some point, be back in our Womack uh, children's waiting room as well. Um, something I know Tawny knows, her son's in it with us as well. We have Operation Little Learners, an amazing program for 18 months to our five-year-old children. It's a program that isn't just for the kids, but it's for the parents. It's a, like a mommy and me program. The parent and child come in together. They spend an hour together doing a craft, reading a book, learning a lesson. But it's teaching the, ch the parent to become the child's first teacher. It also, I think, one of the most important parts, and Tawny mentioned this, we mentioned this across the board, it builds a community. I think as family members, and I'm absolutely, I'm, I'm a 22-year-old, 22-year-old, I wish I was 22, <laughs> sorry. Um, I'm a 22-year military spouse myself, and one of the things I'm, I struggle with every time we move is I become isolated. I become self-reliant, which I think is a good thing, but it actually isolates me. Little Learners is an amazing program because it provides an instant community. It provides instant community of Army spouses there with their children that are the same age as every other child in there, and they instantly bond over that. And then they bond over their military experience. They can, you know, complain about doing PT laundry or something like that, which I complain about often myself. But um, it's an amazing program there. Another program we have for children is Operation Hero. Um, both of my children have been through Operation Hero. Uh, it's a program for school-age kids. It's 10 weeks long. It was absolutely developed for the military child. It is a chance to do some homework uh, with, a, with a mentor, get that first half hour out of the way of getting the math work done, some outdoor activities and that sort. But the final hour is focused on a very specific military child challenge, such as deployment, such as um, transitioning and moving. How does a military child cope with those? Very different than me as an adult. And it gives that child an opportunity to find their community. They're talking with other kids the same age who might be feeling the same thing that might not share it with me as a parent. So it's an amazing program there as well. Uh, we also have Operation Deploy Your Dress, which is another nonprofit like ours that we partner with, providing a free ball gown or a special event dress. We had a lot of proms this last year. Um, any military uh, 
family member or anyone active duty with a, with an ID card can come in and get a, a free dress uh, once a year. So our food pantry is one of our most popular programs right now, one of the ones I'm most proud of, and I can say Tawny is also one of our volunteers. <laughs> so um, we are seeing a really big increase right now, um, but that's also, I think, a great opportunity to say that the partnerships we have from Fayetteville area, from Garrison, they are doing an amazing job of promoting that program. I don't know necessarily if we're seeing an increase in that food insecurity. I think we're doing a better job marketing it and making sure people know about it. Um, it also provides free diapers. So speaking of diapers, um, one of our other programs, we have a family support program called Baby Bundles. Every child born to an enlisted family member at Walmart receives a baby bundle that has first diapers, first clothes, first um, uh, wipes, all the things you need. It's been a while since I've had a baby. <laughs> but everything you need to start that family. What's so amazing about that program is we are absolutely involved at the Armed Services YMCA with the most amazing, wonderful celebration in a person's life. They just had a child. And they get to have that bundle, and they associate our program with that amazing moment in their life. It's also our first introduction to a family member. They might not have known about us. They might not have found us in one of those old mule barns. But they received that bag at Womack, and now they know our services exist. Then our final program, we talk about the readiness part of it. I'm going to go back to the deployment side. So um, this is how we first got Tawny Dixon as one of our main volunteers. We provide a quilt or a pillowcase to any child of a deployed service member. And we don't just do it for Fort Bragg. We do it for all of North Carolina, all of South Carolina, National Guard Reserves, uh, Camp Lejeune. We do it for everybody. Any child with a deployed family member will receive a free homemade quilt or a uh, pillow, pillowcase to take home. It's a comfort item, and it's a keepsake. And we hope that years from now, when that child looks at that, when they're a grown adult, looks at that pillow or that, that uh, quilt, they're going to remember an entire community that built that quilt for them. And they're going to remember their army life with the best feelings of memories and everything that goes with it. So um, I think that's one of the programs I'm so proud of to talk about. Uh, for the Armed Services YMCA, like I said, we are located here on Fort Bragg, and we're happy to um, anybody that would like to come in and visit us, we love that, especially our leadership. We want to be able to talk to you and show you in person what our building offers. Uh, we are nonprofit. Everything we do is through donations and grants. That's my job as a development director. Um, grants and partnerships and sponsorships. So we are so encouraged. We have a partnership with AUSA, which we're so happy to say. Um, so that keeps all of our programs high quality and no cost. And that's a very important objective of ours. As I mentioned, strengthening our military families is our mission. Fort Bragg, our mission is the readiness of that military family. So um, we work closely with the FRG programs as well. So um, I'm happy to take any questions. And um, thank you for having me here today. Thank you. I'm Stephen Moore. I'm a local uh, businessman here in Fayetteville and currently the chairman of the Military Affairs Council of the Greater Fayetteville Chamber. Uh, the, we call the Military Affairs Council the MAC for short, and we're the oldest MAC in the country. It started in 1956, uh, and with the primary focus of providing an avenue for Fort Bragg leaders to uh, meet and be introduced to the business leaders of the community. The MAC, I'm proud to say, has a fantastic board of really stellar military supporters and uh, my re opening remarks are actually a compilation of feedback that I requested from them to uh, give me to talk about. So my remarks are going to look pretty prepared because they are, and that's kind of how I roll. But um, the, uh, I didn't want to just paraphrase, and uh, I didn't want to leave anything out, so here we go. Uh, the MAC as an organization itself does good deeds behind the scenes, such as donate Fayetteville Woodpeckers tickets to recently deployed troops. But looking at the community more broadly, MAC members and their organizations individually do many things, great and small, that support the warfighter, for instance. The Fayetteville Cumberland Economic Development Corporation is at the forefront of helping separating soldiers, military spouses, and veterans find excellent work. 
FCEDC recently received $4 million in federal funds to create the HR Talent Portal that will enable companies to have a recruiting presence close to the base and even set up training spaces there. The FCEDC also has become an official partner with the U.S. Army Reserve's Private Public Partnership Office with the intent to provide employment opportunities to soldiers of the USAR and their families by linking them up with job vacancies within our own existing industries. The unemployment rate for USAR soldiers has been as high as 10%, which equates to approximately 19,000 soldiers. This is an obvious readiness issue, and this partnership will reduce that number. We have local military employers that are super friendly, and here are a couple of examples from uh, chamber members and MAC members. One of our largest employers, the Public Works Commission, or PWC, a utility that is owned by the city of Fayetteville, uses the DOD Skill Bridge program to connect active duty service members with career training opportunities. Through a 90-day on-site internship, PWC is helping transitioning soldiers find successful careers before they exit the military. And on an individual family level, PWC will waive deposits for military customers. One of our MAC members is with an insurance company that hires and retains military spouses and even when those families PCS, they enable them to work remotely so that they can continue to grow in their jobs. The MAC sponsors uh, every year a conference called SIM, Spouses in the Military, to connect military spouses new to the area with opportunities and resources that benefit families. The Fayetteville Woodpeckers Baseball Club has at least a dozen service-focused initiatives such as scholarships for military children to attend summer camps and, of course, free baseball tickets. We have a robust network of military scholarship funds, too many to list, but I'll cite one, the Patriot Foundation, which provides educational scholarships to dependents of fallen or severely disabled veterans. And the Patriot Foundation also advocated uh, to the legislature to open up uh, grants for North Carolina public universities and community colleges to non-residents. Um, support, uh, oh, I should say also while I'm talking about the legislature, the, there is a lot, there have been a lot of uh, laws passed in North Carolina uh, that makes North Carolina one of the, if not the most military friendly state and I can tell you, every single one of those uh, bills has the fingerprints of our own local delegation if they weren't indeed actually initiated by them. Uh, support for the warfighter can also come in ways that you cannot monetize. As you're walking around this crown complex over the next couple of days, you may see their POW MIA chair that remains empty and stanchioned off on the South Concourse. It's not there because, it wasn't set up because AUSA is here. It's there all the, all the time for every event. Uh, when I asked my MAC members uh, for input, one relayed to me, my personal story is that Fayetteville welcomed my family with open arms after we chose to make this our home after separating from the military. We've always felt home here. And another said, during my command, one of my junior soldiers was wounded severely in combat. He was evacuated to Walter Reed to undergo extensive surgery and rehab. He and his wife were raising four kids. Upon notification, the family decided to travel to DC to be at his side. But on the morning that they were to leave, their minivan broke down. They immediately called a rental company, but the cost was prohibitive particularly since they didn't know how long they were gonna to need to use the car. My chaplain got wind of it and called a local car dealer. When they heard the story, the GM <laughs> provided the family with a new car to use for as long as necessary, no questions asked. If you live around here long enough, you'll hear these stories frequently. They do not make the news, but I'm convinced that they do make a difference.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. Now it is time for some questions from the audience. If you have questions for the panelists, you may fill out the cards provided for you or raise your hand and one of our staff will come with a microphone. <clears throat> we would like to address as many questions as possible, so we kindly ask that you be conscious as possible. Major General Dunsney, we're seeing more reports of soldiers finding mold in their barracks, and recently on social media, it looks like the Army is asking soldiers to address it themselves. How are we handling mold in the barracks? Okay, so, um, a great question, and, uh, and I'm, you know, a lot of stuff out there on open source from time to time about you know, mold in barracks, mold in houses. And uh, one thing I'd like to say is, uh, based on I, th I think the, what your reference is, the uh, recent social media posting around soldiers uh, being directed to clean toxic mold, I could tell you unequivocally that is not happening anywhere in the Army, nor will it ever. I don't know any chain of command that's going to have their soldiers doing that. We do not have soldiers now or ever cleaning you know, known toxic mold in the barracks. We do know that soldiers are responsible for clean, basic cleaning and upkeep of their areas and barracks that is, you know, time honored and goes on today just like it always has. But there are special, uh, you know, remediation processes uh, for, you know, what is uh, identified as toxic mold uh, that kick in when that, when that identification is made. In many cases, soldiers are moved out of those areas. There'd be no place, they, no way they could be cleaning it because they're not even in the barracks or in those rooms or in that area any longer for obvious reasons. Uh, but the Army leadership at Echelon takes any discoveries of mold very seriously. And uh, we've got teams that come in and, and test and determine whether it's, you know, common house, the scientific, uh, you know, common household mold versus the various types of toxic mold uh, that can potentially, you know, make someone sick. But in terms of uh, soldiers remediating that, uh, you know, or being directed by the chain of command to remediate that, that, that is not happening, nor will that ever. We have processes for that. Okay. Next question is for Tani. Tani, do you think we have a food, oh, it says Tani and Jill. Okay. <laughs> it says, do you think we have a food insecurity issue with our soldier? or is it more of a financial readiness education issue? Yeah, I'll, go, I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> Tani and I are together a lot, so it feels good that you're to both of us. So um, I think it's actually both of those situations. I think there's an, um, we're seeing that inflation rate creeping up as well. I think it's um, impacting more and more people, not just our junior enlisted, as far as the financial part of it. Um, we do the immediate response at the armed services. We've had that food pantry for that initial um, food that you're in, in need of, um, but we always encourage you after visiting our food pantry, after the second month, it's take a look at some of our ACS, our Army, Army Community Services. What can you do financially to build a budget around where you are right now, um, if, it's, if that helps as well. But um, I think as far as food insecurity, we are responding to it, um, and we are seeing that increase. But again, I go back to, I think we're doing a better job across the board from an organization like the Armed Services YMCA from Garrison to FRG programs of letting people know our services exist. Um, our biggest issue with the Armed Services is we don't do a good enough job of marketing our programs. And so the more people find out about it, the more people are gonna come find us. And um, that's our biggest, I think that's our biggest jump is just people know we exist. We also respond because of these with IRF for BRAG. Um, people initially have that uh, financial uh, stress um, when a unit first moves out. So we're there prepared for that as well. People find out about us. Again, that goes back to Tawny 
um, in a lot of our FRG programs with a lot of these uh, deployment briefs, people find out that we exist, and that's when people are usually find the most financially strapped um, or stressed is right after that initial push out. So knowing what their finances are, so so we respond initially for that food insecurity, but we also push them to other agencies, other organizations, other installation um, groups like ACS to find that financial stability that they might be needing. So. And I just want to add to that that I think during COVID, I think it was a mixture of both, but I also think that it was the retailers limiting what and how much people could purchase as well. And we see that right now in particular with our baby products. In, instead of providing more, we don't clear shelves of formula. We, we literally go out to grocery stores and that's how we fill our food pantry. We get donations from people as well, but primarily we, um, we do a lot of couponing and, and that sort of thing in response to the, all of the um, formula issues that happened across the country. Instead of clearing shelves, we decided to add more protein so families could afford uh, formula. Um, on their own and making sure they would get the kinds that were necessarily for their child. Um, but we are seeing an increase in um, baby support, asking for more help with diapers, asking more help with formula and wipes and basic care items for children. So, Man, if, if I could on that too, uh, because that, that was a new term to me uh, about six months ago, food insecurity. Uh, and you know, uh, the, the potential that, that that type of food insecurity was going on uh, you know, within our army. And, uh, and I can say, you know, a lot of grassroots uh, efforts going on around that at the installation and at the unit level. Obviously, a lot of chain of command involvement and in understanding our soldiers and their families and the challenges that they're facing, not making assumptions that someone has enough food or the right kind of food in their house. Uh, but I would like to just comment that, that is, it's at the Army level now. And uh, there's a, a working group at the Department of the Army, G9, uh, looking at that specific subject uh, as we speak. And so I think there'll be some additional guidance and, and, and things coming uh, from, from the Army, but there's still that expectation. Obviously, a lot of the solution is always gonna be down at that tactical operational level around those kind of challenges. But I just wanted to share with everybody that that's just not some buzzword out there in social media. Uh, I mean, it's in within the walls of the Pentagon right now and, and the Army staff and senior Army leadership uh, to, to look at this and understand what it means and doesn't mean uh, for our soldiers and their families. Thanks. Okay. The next question was directed to um, Dr. Grease. It says, spouses need jobs. Soldiers may need extra income. Have you considered establishing or approving an Uber program? Drivers could be um, cleared, Ubers um, accessed, and family members could pass up, possibly use Ubers and DUIs would be less. That's a great, that's a great uh, idea. So I don't know if I've actually, anybody's actually looked at Uber itself, or those kind of things, but transportation on an installation of this size is, is always a challenge. Spouse employment, however, is a key quality of life initiative. So we're looking at all different types of opportunities from home-based businesses. So we have people on base that have ID cards, they're doing type of Uber, Uber and they can come on post. Um, we're also, as an IRF f platform and across any installation, we're also what we call the strategic support area, which is a protected, we, we have to keep our, our security well. So some of this is vetting and having people that are, you know, make sure they have access and stuff. And sometimes that, that process can be a little burdensome for some people. Uh, so we're trying to streamline all those things. We're trying to have a greater emphasis of working with downtown economic development to, to do Spouse employment. We're working at spouse employment as a as a significant quality of life factor here at Fort Bragg, and we do all that stuff. So I'll take those back. Those are great, great questions, specific questions, and I'll I'll talk to our team that works that, and then we'll put that in there. But we're we're looking at all kinds of things: uh, employment on post, off post, working with downtown training programs, etc. Okay. Um, Steve Moore, this question was directed to you. How does the Fayetteville, Fayetteville community support military families with their children? Well, I'm uh, really glad to have an opportunity to address that because a lot of the comments have been about, you know, child focused. And I want to tell you about the, the Cumberland County Partnership for Children. The Partnership for Children was an 
idea that the state of North Carolina launched here in Fayetteville uh, back in the 90s as a pilot program. And it has been so successful that it is now in all 100 counties of North Carolina and it's been exported and copied in all the other 49 states. But the oldest one has been going on here. They are focused on uh, increasing uh, the quality of life for children ages uh, birth to five. And a lot of that is focused on making sure all children are ready to um, be at the same level when they get to kindergarten. And a lot of that goes to childcare, having not only uh, enough childcare options, but quality childcare options. And I know you, uh, General Dunsany mentioned the standards. So one of the things that the Partnership for Children does is they standardize any um, child care facility that wants to participate in their program and they give them a star rating, a three, four, and five star. And this really helps the, uh, the, the facility as well because if they rate as a three star, then they can, get, they can see the standards, what do I need to do to raise to four? What do I need to do to get from four to five? And then, so when your soldiers come and, and live here and are seeking them, they can evaluate childcare by the number of stars that they have and see if, uh, uh, so they, they'll know that, it's, it, that they, they, they're meeting standards. Um, the uh, other thing that they uh, implement is North Carolina's pre-K uh, program. And so, uh, and, and actually regardless of the sponsor's rate, rank, but uh, based on space ability, they're putting um, children into free uh, pre-K in the North Carolina schools. And uh, they also work with the Diaper Bank from North Carolina. Are you familiar? You, you probably yeah, we know them well. With them. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, uh, um, that's, you know, it's been a very big and helpful uh, organization in our community. Okay. So okay. Uh, on, that, on that point, uh, on the child care, uh, we get a lot of, uh, have a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, we're, we're going to build a lot more CDCs over the next five or six years. And uh, so that capability is going to continue to expand in the Army. But in the meantime, for a family member that's at pick a post, there's no seats available in the CDC, and there won't be anytime soon. Now what? So we're working uh, to be able to identify those outside of the gate that do meet standards. And there is fee assistance available. So you could identify those to the family and say, we, we have you on the wait list here, but there is two standard high level, whether it's three or four star rated uh, uh, childcare uh, centers right outside of the gate or several miles away uh, that we could refer you out to and you could receive fee assistance uh, to take your child there and, and we know that they have a high standard uh, and of accredited uh, child care at that location and they have seats available now. Uh, because many times I know in my own family, uh, our window for getting our children into child care was very small. So it wasn't something where, okay, we could sit around and wait six months. Uh, we needed it in six days. Uh, so if it wasn't here, what's the alternative? So that alternative is out there in, in the community in many cases, and we're working with those partnerships so we can identify those to, and streamline that because otherwise you're in some type of search. You're, you're going to these places you don't know. I don't know. We don't got a good feeling about this one, okay, uh, to, to help the soldiers and their families uh, get to that make that choice, yep, we'll, 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 we'll uh, enroll our, our uh, son and daughter there. Okay. And Tawny, the question is, when you got to Fort Bragg, how did you first get involved with volunteering? So I first got involved through the SFRG program because um, it's at the unit level. It's what I know best, my husband's Army career. Um, it's also the easiest way to build my military community because those are the people that are going to go to the field with my husband. Those are the people that are going to deploy with my husband. So I got involved in the SFRG. Um, I was asked to be an SFRG leader. Uh, and then I just did some volunteer recruitment and got a bunch of, a team of 15 spouses. And they were my key callers. I had some co-leaders, secretaries, other positions that I made available. 
Um, and then I also, when, I, when you go into the Volunteer Management Information System, also known as VMIS, you can see all the available opportunities that are there at your installation. So here at Fort Bragg, I had never heard of Armed Services YMCA, but my grandmother was a master quilter and she passed me, she passed down her, her passion to me. And so when I heard that they did the kids comfort and they built the quilts and the pillowcases, that was something that I wanted to do for our community. Um, so I got involved at Armed Services YMCA and then I helped out with the food pantry and pretty much every other program that they offer. Also, uh, my husband is an avid fisher, a uh, bass fisher, and so, you know, just watching him go through multiple deployments and the stress of the IRF and just being a service member in general, he likes to go out, go fishing on the weekends, and I brought up to him, you know, why don't you take out other people that want to go fishing, active duty veterans? So we started a program where we focus on veterans uh, with disabilities and PTSD, um, and so, we built this program where my husband has taken out multiple vets, he spent hundreds of hours, and one of the success stories is that there was a guy that came out, um, he had PTSD, very scared to be away from his dog, um, and he went out with my husband, he didn't say a single word the whole time they were fishing. Um, and then they got off the boat, my husband calls me, he says, I don't know if he had a good time, I don't know, you know what happened, and then, he calls them and says, thank you so much, Miss Dixon, for letting me have your husband for eight hours today because it truly changed my life. And they went out a couple more times and now he is literally traveling with the pros as a co-angler and he, he does, that's how he, you know, works through his PTSD. So I think starting with SFRG is how I started my volunteerism here at Fort Bragg and then seeing the change and the impact in the community to develop our own program. Okay, the next question is for Major General Desney and Dr. Grease. Can you describe how the Army and Garrison Commands are planning to, on leveraging data to support family readiness and empower command teams? Okay, uh, so from a macro level, uh, you know, we uh, bring data into every discussion because it informs the decisions that our senior leaders uh, have to make uh, about key resourcing uh, challenges uh, that we have, time, money, people. And uh, so um, all, all of our, all of those initiatives that I talked about, whether it's PCS moves, if you would see the cop that we have and it runs daily on PCS moves, it is entirely data driven. We know exactly how many people PCS today, this week, where they went, what, what deliveries were made on time, what ones were not made on time. Uh, the, amount, the amount of data and, uh, is very similar to what you would see probably like in a brigade talk these days. I mean, it's like more than you could practically absorb in a day. Uh, but it does inform our, our leaders and we use that data to uh, help drive the decisions, particularly around resourcing uh, and also it arms us when we, when we take uh, all of these initiatives up to the senior army leadership uh, at the Pentagon, because the first question you get is, what, what data are you using behind that? You know, that, that statement is interesting, mildly interesting at this point. It will become very interesting if there's some concrete data that you're using uh, and that you're tracking uh, behind that uh, so that we could fully understand and have full, you know, full common operating picture uh, that'll drive decisions that are going to be made. And I would say that the data that we're looking at today, much of it doesn't necessarily, it, you know, it, it, some of these things are very difficult to impact on, on like a operational 24, 48, 72 hour, 96 hour cycle that you would get in an operation. The data we're looking at is driving decisions for, for a POM and things that are going to be built for a funding cycle for th barracks that are gonna be built in 2025, decisions are being made now. So the data is critical, because if you, ma you make, a, if, if that decision, there, there's, if that decision, if that data's not right, it could drive a really wrong decision that will have impact several years down the road and, and uh, the, we're dealing with a finite uh, amount of resources and time and money. So uh, it, it definitely informs things. Uh, it's a huge part of, of how we try to get this right on a day-to-day -day basis. At the tactical level, um, 
we have, are getting better all the time with the data collection. We have lots of data on lots of different things like everybody does, but the question is, is which one of those data points is a lever, is a leading indicator or a lagging indicator? How does it inform resource in a, in a, in a space of con, constrained resources? Which levers do you invest in, uh, especially if it takes a long time? Which ones do you have to take, accept some risk in? So for example, barracks. Um, we have a very refined evaluation of a barracks that talks about the, where a person walks out, uh, the unit, per, first of all, the unit, the user, evaluates the barracks and says, my roof is this, or it needs paint, or look, those kind of things, and on that assessment, we send an engineer out after that and look at the bones of the building. Is it, how's the basement, is it leaking, or those kind of things, and we do an assessment. And each, each facility on the installation, um, and here, here at Fort Bragg, that's about 10,032 facilities that we have records on, gets one of those little ratings. What quality, what quality condition or condition code it is, what um, status it is for mission, is it purpose built? You know, is it a barracks that's purpose built for a barracks or is it an old building that wasn't a barracks and we converted to barracks? But we have those data points along a lot of, a lot of different things. How fast, what we call bomb cycle, for example. How fast uh, um, a person moves out of their house uh, on base housing and we get it flipped, we get it renovated and flipped and repainted and recarpeted or whatever it needs to be. To, and the next family's in. And so that's, there's a standard for all those, and we measure all those. The, the, those are actually refining, and over time, as, as the general said at the AMC level, we're feeding those cops. The PCS surge has really come, matured over the last three years to do that. So we can tell. So every week, every single week, um, the, the senior commander right now, General Don Hughes, deployed, right? But when they were here on station, every week, every Tuesday, we're briefing him on what are the house of goods, what is the current house of goods, what's the speed, what's the, is the weight. If the wait, if the wait time gets past a certain point in time, I want to know the name of that family, I want to know where we're going and how we're getting that fixed. That's briefed every week, so we're doing that data. The one point of data that we're trying to get at is the quality data, is how well we did it. So not just did we do it, but how well we're doing it. And that's one of the reasons I, I emphasize with him, the tenant survey, the only way we get well quality data is the user telling us, this is how I feel about what you're providing. The tenant survey, we do other surveys on the installation. We're gonna do, here at Bragg, we're gonna ramp that up a little bit to be more specific in questions. So that's how we use the data. We bring that back, we have lots of data, we look, we sort through it to see which ones can make a difference, which ones, which ones we can accept risk on, which ones we never accept risk on, and the risk acceptance is really the feedback from the families. Like, we don't accept any risk on mold, we don't accept any risk on bad housing, we don't do that. In fact, uh, the MCOM's commanding general has a meeting every Friday, every Monday, mo Monday afternoon by name on every soldier that's not in their house because of a repair or something like that. I have to, I have to myself with the garrison command, I have to brief that and when they're getting back, and that's the question. And then, you know, how did they, what was their experience for that, that time out? So that's, that's, tactically, that's how we're using them here at the garrison. Yeah, we have, we have an entire group of, of data analytics experts, ORSAs, uh, who pull this together, uh, and because uh, it's in a massive amount uh, of data that is collected. Uh, with that, you would think there would be analysis by paralysis, and uh, that, that, there's always a danger of that, right? And many of us have experienced that. You, know, you experience it sometimes even in, a, in an operational sense. But, uh, you know, I know that General Daly, the CG uh, at Army Materiel Command, has got a keen sense for operationalizing things. And uh, I, I've been really impressed in my time there around the quality of life initiatives at how the data is operationalized and really does help inform, drive resourcing and decisions, and particularly inside, you know, a, as you get up into the strategic levels of leadership of the Army, uh, many things that you intuitively want to do if you can't back it up with data or you don't have something behind it, uh, very difficult for that to pick up any steam or for that initiative to get any traction. And Jill, this is for you. Is there a membership required for the Armed Services YMCA like there is for the regular YMCA? No, and we are, if I, I'll go back a bit, we are part of the big YMCA program. We are just a, a division of it that's focused only on military and military programming and services for our military families. There's no membership, there are no dues. Um, we do, most of our programs, 90% uh, are no cost. Um, the one that we do charge for, and we talk about childcare a bit, um, we do have an after-school program in Harnett County 
we recognized that the Fayetteville and Cumberland County had that taken care of, and we saw the need in Harnett County as more and more of our soldiers are moving out to that area. So we have an after-school program. We do, however, keep it at the lowest cost possible. We work with CYS, so it's the same charge. We do not uh, create any revenue off our after-school programs. It basically covers our charge, our cost, and we always work with CYS to keep it the same price level as well, so we're not charging more for military families. But no dues, no memberships. Um, you just, if there's a program you're interested in, you just go to our website, um, and I wish I could say it off the top of my head, don't tell anybody <laughs> that, but um, you go to our website and you register for it. It'd be the food pantry, Operation Little Learners, and I always encourage people to look at our Facebook site as well. That's when you hear about a lot of these programs opening up, and a lot of our uh, seasonal programs, Tawny is one of our big volunteers for this as well, our toy drives during Christmas, our Operation Ride Home through um, the generous support of Jack Daniels, where we give over 100 military families, we cover all of their uh, travel expenses, be it planes, trains, automobiles, to get home for Christmas. Here at Fort Bragg, we extend that from the beginning of November all, th all the way through December because we have a lot of offset leave time. So we have, you know, IRF might be home for Christmas, I mean, home for Thanksgiving, but not Christmas. So, but no dues, no fees. Um, everything is done as a nonprofit through grants and uh, partnerships. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining us today and the great insight on your discussion and questions. We've had a great day. Um, I want to thank our panelists for their expertise and the insight and valuable information they've shared with us today. Uh, <clears throat> I want to thank everyone for attending and I look forward to everyone um, coming back this afternoon and joining us at 1330. <clears throat> I'd like everyone to please give our panelists another round of applause. Well, thanks, Tina, for our newest addition to a senior fellow program, Tina Wright, our first spouse senior fellow. But uh, for an event focused on the warfighter, what, where better to start than on, with our warfighter's families, our spouses, family readiness and resilience. So thanks again to a great panel. All right, so we're off to a great start of this event. There's, there's more to come after lunch. Uh, please join us in the exhibit hall next door for an afternoon reception. Uh, you'll have a little over an hour to visit the exhibit hall displays and you know, partake in the reception. Please return to your seats by 1330 for our next panel, uh, USASOC and the Future of Irregular Warfare. So 1330, thank you. <laughs>